Good evening, everybody. My name is Fernando Alejandro, and I am pleased to be able to come before you guys and give a lesson concerning the parable of the sower. If we could all turn over to Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, it reads, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. I want to take a moment and pause here. Within this scripture, Jesus is telling this parable. He's speaking about these seeds that fall on different types of soils, and each soil represents something different. And each one of these soils is a teaching that we can draw knowledge from, and certainly we can draw truth from that God is, is teaching us. But I want to focus in at this moment on the statement, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, as stated in verse 10. It's incredible to think that what Jesus is talking about here, he is calling a secret of the kingdom of God. And not just that it's a secret, he's, he's letting his disciples know that, hey, you guys, are privileged to hear the truth about God's kingdom. And to you, I will explain the knowledge of the, the kingdom of God, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. And to all others, I'm going to speak in parables. And it makes a statement, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, where he says, though seeing they may not see, and though hearing they may not understand. And when I think of that, I of course consider just the amazing privilege it is to know that we can know God's plans, that we can know his heart, we can know his intention, that his word is available to us for us to, to know and, and, and to follow, that we can implement that into our lives. It's no secret that he's keeping from us. In fact, he's revealing to us everything that he wants us to know. He is close and he wants us to be close to him. But whenever I've read that passage, the, the quote from Isaiah that Jesus has there, it's always kind of tip, tripped me up because it almost sounds like he's saying, I don't want people to know the truth. I don't want people to understand. And I want to explain a little bit about this confusion that I had. And to do so, uh, it really hinges upon understanding that Jesus is quoting from the book of Isaiah. You see, in the New Testament, when you see these Old Testament quotes, when they're quoting from another book of the Bible, and especially throughout the Gospels when we see this, what is going on is that Jesus is trying to call us back to a moment in, in the past, in history. And he's trying to say, hey, there's something about that situation in Isaiah that parallels to this moment here. And if we want to understand the moment, uh, that is, the moment that is going on now, we need to understand what was going on back then as well. And so when he quotes Isaiah chapter 6, he's giving us a context to look into. He's giving us a story to look into. And as I read through that, going back into Isaiah, I saw something that happened right before these words were spoken to Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 5, there's almost like a second parable of the sower. It's a different type of parable of the sower. 
And I'm going to read that for you today. It starts in Isaiah chapter 5 in verse 1, where it reads, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Jumping down to verse seven, it says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A 10 acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine, a homer of seed will yield only an ephah of grain. So what's going on here? Well. In this telling, God is telling the story of a vineyard that he planted. He's using this analogy that I've cleared out this, this vineyard. I've cleared out the rocks out of the soil. I've planted the choicest vines to grow up. And as, I, as I've planted this, I expect to be good fruit. I came back expecting there to be good fruit, but I only found bad. And then when he jumps down and starts explaining, he says, look, I created the nation of Israel. I gave you guys my word. I gave you the righteousness you were to follow. And yet when I looked down and I was looking for justice, I saw bloodshed. Instead of you guys upholding my law, which I called you to do, you abandoned that to shed blood. And not only did you do that, but as I looked for the righteousness, the standard of holiness that I gave you, I looked for that and instead I heard the distress the cries of distress, people being wrong, people being sinned against. And when you look at Isaiah, it's, it, it's rich with, with explanations of just how the, the people in power had turned their back on the poor, on the widows, on the orphans, the people who are most vulnerable and needed protection, they were the ones being exploited. And so God says, where is the justice? And what he's doing here is he's, he's looking at them and he's telling them, I expect obedience to my word. So when we get to Isaiah 6, and he, Isaiah is saying, hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see, they won't understand. What that quote is all about is God is telling Isaiah to tell the people that they've ignored my word. That they've gone out, they knew what my word said, they heard what my, my word had to say but they've turned their back on it. So now they no longer hear it. They no longer see it. They no longer understand it. And now the punishment is coming. The judgment was coming in, in Isaiah. So when Jesus parallels this in the time that he's speaking in now, he's quoting from Isaiah. This is a moment where the people hearing this, his disciples hearing this quote, they are alarmed. They are shocked. This is, this is, this is one of those attention grabbers, and it's meant to produce a little bit of alarm in the hearers. Because this parable, the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, it's about God's word and his expectation for obedience. And that is at the base of all of this. And what upholds it is the words that we hear, the, what we learn from God's word. We're, what we do with it is entirely within our control and it determines really which way that God's word is going to grow or not in our life. And so the question becomes, are you bearing fruit by using God's word? Or perhaps more succinctly placed, is God's word bearing fruit in you? And this is what we're going to explore in this lesson. And the way that we are going to approach this, we're going to split this up into two separate lessons. We're going to look at the uh, parable, or sorry, we're going to look at the seed that falls on the hardened path. 
And then in the second part, we're going to look at all the seeds that bore fruit, that actually, or sorry, that, that took root, and, and see what teachings and encouragements and corrections we can learn from that. But today, I want to focus in on two key ideas. The first being that God expects obedience to His Word, and two, that our heart, the condition of our heart, and in particular, whether our heart is hardened or not, that is going to determine whether or not God's word will take fruit in your life. And so this is the question I want us to consider as we go through today and as we go through next week's lessons, we need to consider that question, is God's word bearing fruit in my life? Continuing on in Luke chapter 8, in verse 11, it reads, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. For a long time as I read this, I always sort of believe that this did not mean me because I'm like, well, I already believed. I already followed God's word. I already was baptized and therefore I, I, I am saved and therefore I can't be hard of heart. But the more I think about the context of it, Jesus is speaking to a group of people who showed up specifically to listen to Christ speak. This means that this wasn't an irreligious crowd. These were people who were largely believers of God. These were people who came out to be within a community of faith and to listen to a preacher speak God's word. So these weren't unbelievers as we might think of them. And still Jesus is saying that there's people in this crowd right here who have come out to listen to me speak, whose hearts are in such a place that God's word will never take root and they themselves will not believe and be saved. And that gives me some pause because it makes me consider, wow, God's standard is that his word needs to bear fruit in my life. It needs to take root. And if that's his expectation, then I can't just be so quick to think that I'm fine without considering is God's word bearing fruit. And so I also have to consider with that, is my heart hard? And when I thought about this question, I thought about, well, what are some signs of a hardened heart? And I think of how the hard heart is entirely unreceptive to God's word. And what does that look like? Well, are there parts of God's word that you simply will not obey? You know, there are some difficult things that God calls us to do, some things that are, are uncomfortable. Sometimes we're called to be open. Sometimes we're called to share our faith. Sometimes we are called to act on behalf of one another and look after each other in a sacrificial way. And sometimes these things that we're being called to do can be uncomfortable and they can be a sacrifice. And yet God's word still calls us to them. And so are there parts of God's word that we look at and say, I'm just not going to do it. Not that we wrestle with it, not that we, we, <laughs> we take the passage and we say, ah, you know, this is tough, but I'm going to obey. Not that. I think all of Scripture is meant to be wrestled with. But the question is, are there parts of it that we simply will not do? This means that God's word cannot take root in your heart. We are picking and choosing what we want to follow. And that is certainly not the expectation that God had. And another question is, do we hear God's word? Do we hear sermons? Do we hear teachings? Or even in our own quiet times, do we see God's word and yet draw nothing that we can implement into our lives? If all we do is hear and listen and read, but never find anything that we can implement or change or, or grow in, then God's word is not, is not taking effect. It's not taking root. In our, in our lives. And we need to make sure that we're not those who just hear and consume, 
but never grow and never understand. A good question to ask is, can you be challenged by God's word? What I mean by this is, if I proclaim to be a follower of Christ, and another follower says to me, hey, I see something in your life that doesn't match up with God's word, and they present to me God's word and show me this is what it says, am I able to look at that and say, you know what, I need to change, and then set out to repent in that change? Or am I closed off to any input in my life? Do I get defensive, not at the person, but at God's word? And this is a sign that our heart is hard. And I think a big one in this day and age is simply, are we willing to change our beliefs to match God's word? Or do we bend God's word to match our beliefs? And this can happen when the standards of righteousness that we are called to live by run against our own desires. And we can want to implement sin into our lives. We can want to engage in sin, but we don't want to feel guilty about it. So we take God's word and we start to bend it. Did it, does it really say this? Is it really this strict? Oh, there's always grace. So if I give in to sin, God will just forgive me. And we're bending God's word so that we can follow our own sinful ways. And this is, this is a sign of a hardened heart. We're rejecting God's word, and God's word isn't able to take root in our hearts. The question becomes, are we content to hear but not understand? You know, understanding has to do with the actions we take. To give an analogy, I could read a book about karate, and upon closing that last chapter, I could proclaim myself to be a master, but I don't think anyone would believe that to be true. Nor do I think that my mere reading of a book concerning that topic would be enough for me to go and compete on some high level. Instead, I would then need to put it into practice to understand whether the principles I've read, whether or not I can actually do them and whether I can do them well. And as I grow in doing them, I, I can gain mastery over that subject. And it's the same with God's word. It really is through our training, through our action, through our doing, that we really know God's word. Otherwise, we're just hearing. We're just taking in information, but we don't understand it. We don't truly know it until it is in action in our lives. And that action will produce the, the, the fruit of God's word. And so, this seed in particular begs us to pay attention to how we are receiving God's word. Is it something that we just listen to, or is it something we obey, something that we do? And you know, this hardening of the heart, it can occur gradually. We can start in a place where we accepted God's word, where we practiced God's word, where we did uh, what the word calls us to do. But then over time, slowly but surely begin to abandon God's word, begin to, to disobey or to simply just leave it alone and not take the, the actions. And it won't happen overnight, but over time, our heart can harden. And we've seen this. We've seen people who've been faithful for many years just suddenly up and leave, except that that sudden up and leaving was something that was happening gradually over time. I think of, of the analogy of a bottle floating in the sea. If you're ever out on the ocean, you see a bottle in the water, you can see the waves kind of tossing it up and down, but it almost looks like it's staying in the same place. You could watch it for a long time. It almost seems like it's staying in one place. But over time, by the evening, you see it's all the way out in the horizon. And that's how it can happen in our lives. It, without being aware of it, we can suddenly just be gone. We can be far gone to the standards that God is calling us to. And this is where we have to take caution and to take account of our own hearts and consider these questions of whether I'm hardened right now. I may not have been before, and amen for that, but am I in this place right now? 
<clears throat> in Hebrews 2, verse 1, and I love how this scripture puts it, it says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. And this, message, this scripture in particular is an encouragement to start p- taking stock, to pay attention to the message we've heard and to look, take stock of our own lives and say, am I following this now? Is this still relevant for me now? Otherwise, we can go ahead and drift away from God over time. <clears throat> so, as we consider the seed that falls on the hardened path, we have to understand that if God's word is not allowed to take root, Satan is just going to come pick it up and take it off. And in, in this verse, in verse 12, it tells us specifically that when that happens, we don't believe and we're not saved. This is more than just a, a area where we can look at it and say, okay, how can I gauge myself here? It's literally a salvation matter. And so I beg of all of us, all who hear this, to consider that question, am I obedient to God's word? Is God's word bearing fruit in my life? And as I mentioned before, Next week, we're going to cover the seeds that fall on soil and take root and see what it looks like for God's word to take root in our life and also the warnings and the dangers that, can, that, can, uh, that we need to abide by to be aware of the things that can get in the way of God's word growing in our lives. For today, I leave you with those questions. Thank you and good night.